I rewrote The Rings of Power Season 1. The original show was awful, as most people would agree, and I, being a lowly internet storyteller, realized that I could do a better job than the writers for the original. Now that I've finished, I want to share a couple of thoughts about my own version of the show in relation to the original, what the other seasons would be, and some self-criticism before making a little bit of a apology announcement for you all. If, however, you haven't seen or rather listened to my rewrite and would like to, please click on the link in the description. Now that we're all caught up, this series, as I said at the beginning, was an attempt to show that I could write a better story, one with a more coherent plot, better characters, and one which was more accurate to Tolkien's writings while still maintaining most of the same characters and events, with the additional restriction that the main characters all have a similar beginning and ending. Whether or not I succeeded in this regard is something which it would be foolish for me to attempt to judge, and people usually aren't called upon to make an evaluation of their own work in any case, but I still had some thoughts which I thought would be good to share in this video. One thing I did not include in my restrictions was that all the material had to come from the information contained in what Amazon bought. The main reason for why I didn't do this was for the simple fact that, one, I didn't care. Two, while I didn't write it this way, I feel like most of the discrepancies could be fixed with at most minor changes. And three, no one has ever actually provided me with a list of things they are or are not allowed to include. For instance, yes, they don't have access to unfinished tales, but does that mean they're forbidden from mentioning that Galadriel strove with Elendil and Eregion? Hello Future Me says that they don't have access to the name Anatar, and maybe they don't have access to Elendil either. I don't know, it's actually been a really long time since I last read Lord of the Rings. But they use Quenya and presumably some Sindar throughout the show, and I don't think it's limited to what little words are in the text of the Lord of the Rings. So I have no idea why they can't just use that name or create another name for him based on that. My point is, the showrunners can't have been so absolutely restricted in what they were allowed to show, and still have been allowed the amount of creative freedom they had to break the lore. And if that is the case, then I washed my hands of copyright law in general, and will throw myself in with the American Communist Party. To arms, comrades. In any case, I wanted to talk about what the remainder of the seasons would have been in this alternate show. Season 2 would follow three major plot lines, and several minor ones. Marigold and Glorfindel would explore the East until they discover more fully what Sauron's plan is. Making a few allies will become important later. Celebrimbor and the High Elves reacting to the forging of the One Ring and them preparing for war, as well as, well, war being brought to their doorstep. And Minister would return to Numenor to become king after the death of both his father and then Tar Telperion. The minor plot lines would be Galadriel gradually coming to rule Lorenand, as well as receiving Nenya from Celebrimbor, who seeks her advice. The Southlands, likewise, would retreat west across the Anduin and establish a new community just south of the White Mountains. The Glorfindel Marigold plot would culminate in a great rebellion headed by Marigold in episode, say, 6 which would disrupt Sauron enough that he is forced to delay his plans, allowing both for the elves to more properly prepare for war and avoid destruction, for Glorfindel to escape and head west, and for the Three Rings to be kept safe from Sauron. Despite being put down, Marigold would escape, and the East will retain many memories of this rebellion. Finally, we would gradually witness the destruction of the burgeoning Kingdom of Angmar, as Varix would succumb to the power of the Ring. A struggle likewise would ensue in khazad between supporters of Narfi and Durin. And thus in these two plot lines, we would have a taste of what the Rings would do to the other kingdoms of men and dwarves. Season 3 would contain the bulk of the war between the Elves and Sauron, and would show Celebrimbor sacrificing himself bravely, while Elrond and many of the other High Elves retreat with the Rings. Still, Sauron would seize the rings which he, in the form of Alendil, helped to forge in Season 1, and begin gifting those to the various kingdoms of men and dwarves. Elrond would bring the three, except Nenya, to Gilgalad, who would effectively hide them. We would see the founding of Rivendell, and alliances would be forged with the various middlemen, whose kingdoms have already fallen into disarray on account of the Nine Rings. This season would be rather tragic, and I even plan the death of Marigold towards the end, though I haven't decided on when, how, or where she would die, and I likely never will, for reasons I'll explain more fully soon. This season is where the show begins to take a decidedly darker tone, which will only increase from here on out. But it does end on a more victorious note. For at the end of the season, Tar Minister successfully rallies the totality of Numenor, and assembles a mighty host, and comes to the aid of Gilgalad and Elrond, who are besieged in Linden and Rivendell. 
We see the great battle of Guatlo, which I expect will be able to even put Amazon's budget to the test, and Sauron's forces will be defeated. Sauron will retreat back to Barador, and swear vengeance upon the Numenorians, who robbed him of his final victory. Season 4 will skip ahead on the timeline, and will perhaps be the place where I would most of all have to reorder the chronology reported in Appendix B in Lord of the Rings. Still, the main stage of the story would be Numenor, between the reigns of Taratanamir to Ar Adunachor. Adunachor. How would you pronounce that? How would I manage to fit almost 900 years into the course of a single season? I have no idea. But I do know that if you gave me six years to do it and a hundred million dollars, I'd absolutely be able to find a way that is both faithful and satisfying. Anyway, the season would reintroduce the Nazgul and have a point of view once more in the East, a descendant of one of the rebels from season two being the main character. This plotline would show the gradual beating down of the East and South under Sauron's rule until they are fully consolidated. Similarly, we will watch the elves in the west and in the greenwood gradually regaining strength after Sauron has been driven out of Eriador, but how at each turn they are prevented by Sauron's agents and the rings which he has given to men and dwarves. However, the season would focus on the splitting of the faithful and the king's men, the mistrust of the Numenorians against the Balar, and the growing pride and greed of the Numenorians, especially among the nobility. We would see Pelargir becoming the main refuge of the faithful, and Umbar's gradual decay alongside the rest of the king's men. We would watch as the corruption of the Numenorians takes its toll upon the lands of Middle-earth, and this would all culminate in the banning of Elvish and the adoption of the Numenorian language as the official language of the island. Season 5 would be the longest season and would likely have 14 episodes. Episodes 1 through 12 would show Sauron regaining power in Middle-earth, and once more beginning to exert strength. He begins waging war on the elves and the men around Mordor, which begins to bring him into conflict with the Numenorians. While this is going on, we would get to meet Elendil and his two sons, Isildur and Anarion, who will not be participating in Seaguard and shouting mantras like, The sea is always right. It is through them that the conflicts of the faithful and the king's men would be most brutally played out, as they have to navigate an entirely hostile field. This hostility erupts with Tar Palantir's ascension to the throne of Numenor. His open repentance unveils just how thoroughly the whole of Numenor has turned against the Valar, and we will see the beginnings of a civil war, or at least a rebellion in Numenor headed eventually by Farazan. Elendil and his sons, however, are effective at guiding the faithful during this new opportunity of Tar Palantir's reign. For during it, the faithful are allowed to live in peace. Eventually, however, Tar Palantir dies, and Muriel attempts to take the throne before Farazan usurps the scepter from her. Almost immediately, he puts down any resistance to this usurpation, and decides to gain the people's trust by means of military conquest. Indeed, we will see this plan building in his mind throughout the season, for we will already know his target. Back on Middle-earth, Sarn will have gained nearly all of his former strength, and begins threatening the elves en masse. Still, his main focus for now is the Numenorean colonies throughout Middle-earth, where he makes no distinction between the faithful and the king's men. Arafarazan leads a great armada to Middle-earth and annihilates Sauron's armies. Sauron himself is taken prisoner, and Arafarazan returns to Numenor in glorious triumph, having completely won the trust of the king's men. This would be the end of episode 10. In episode 11, we will see him move the faithful to the eastern side of Numenor out of suspicion. We will then see Sauron quickly rise the ranks of Numenor until he becomes our Farazan's advisor. Indeed, he will be using many of the same methods of flattery that we saw Lalendil use throughout this first season, until he convinces Farazan to build the great armament and declare war on Valinor. Elendil and his sons would be shown to be hated by Sauron more intensely than any other creature in Arda, and their enmity would, at some point, terrify Elendil. Episode 12 would have two main perspectives, Farazan and the King's Men on the one hand, and Elendil and the Faithful on the other. Muriel would coordinate with Elendil and Isildur to take whatever of their good Numenorean heritage they could, for they all knew that the end of Numenor was upon them. Elendil and his followers flee. And as they flee, our Farazan and his army docks at Amman and finds it silent. For a second, we see the splendor of that land casting such a power of magnificence upon Farazan and his army that they stop and almost seem to repent before wholly turning to darkness and charging forth to Alqualande. We hear Manwe's great voice praying in Quenya to the One, and the One responds. 
A great fissure would open up deep within Arda, and shots throughout Numenor, Amon, and Middle-earth show how drastically this affects the whole world. For as those who have read Tolkien's writings know, it is here that Middle-earth itself is changed. The cataclysmic shocks of the earth would cause an avalanche of stone to rain down upon the whole of the Numenorean host, and would bury them there. The sea itself would seem to contort, and, as Muriel had feared, the destruction of Numenor in the form of a great wave would wash over the whole of the island burying it beneath the sea, and Muriel herself being drowned in the waves as she attempted to reach Menaltarma. But the faithful would make it to Middle-earth. Episode 13 would show the founding of Gondor in the south and Arnor in the north, the creation of alliances with men and the taking up of oaths of allegiance in return for order, elevation, and protection. Elendil, in particular, would not be confident in the destruction of Sauron after the fall of Numenor, and so would forge stronger relations with the elves. At the end of the episode, he would prove to be right, for Sauron would soon return. Arajuin would begin to erupt again, and Orcish raids would begin all throughout Athelion. Still, we will have seen that Gilgalad and Elrond have grown much stronger in Sauron's absence, and atop Amon Sul, Elendil, Isildur, and Gilgalad would forge the last alliance. Episode 14, which I'm thinking could easily be two hours long and almost a movie in and of itself, would begin with Sauron's preparations for the destruction of Gondor being put underway while he fully regains his body. The War of the Last Alliance would begin with Sauron's attack on Minas Ithil, revealing that he has already gathered great power, but still not having regained his full strength. For this host will be of noticeably smaller size compared with the host which Minas Tirith and Farazhan had fought previously. Still, we see the White Tree burned, whose significance would have been built up throughout the past several seasons, and Isildur flees north to take counsel with his father and Gilgalad. Anarion stays in Osgiliath to defend against Sauron's next strike, and during this sequence the men of Dunharo would refuse their oaths and Isildur would pronounce his curse upon them. Isildur would meet with his father and Gilgalad in Arnor, and after making the assessment based on the information which Isildur offers them, they realize that Sauron is not fully at his previous strength, and that they have the strength to defeat him. Linden is immediately called to war, as is all of Arnor, and the host is brought to Rivendell where the remainder of the host of Aragion is mustered. Meanwhile in Gondor, Osgiliath would be assaulted in a battle which is of similar scale, if not of similar sequence or outcome, as the siege of Minas Tirith and the Battle of the Pelennor Fields. Still, Osgiliath would hold and Sauron would be repulsed. The host of the Last Alliance would join up with the Wood Elves, and the host of Gondor would likewise be mustered by Anarion. We would then go to the Battle of Dagor Lad, in the plains above the Black Gate, where the whole host of Sauron would, at last, be utterly broken and flee into Mordor. We would then see the host of the Last Alliance break through the Black Gates and begin the Siege of Barad-dûr, which, unfortunately, would not be able to last for seven years. Still, it is here that Anarion would be slain, and Gilgalad would challenge Sauron to come out himself. Sauron would then duel Gilgalad and Elendil, killing both of them, but, nevertheless, being subdued, and Isildur would take the shards of his father's sword Narsil and cut the ring from Sauron's finger. The series would end with Isildur being counseled to destroy the ring, not inside the volcano, by the way, refusing to do so and bringing it with him back to Gondor. The last alliance would disperse, the three rings would be unveiled and used, and the Numenorean armies would disband and return to their homes. Barad-dûr would be leveled, and we would even see Mordor beginning to return to its natural state. Elrond, however, has misgivings about the future, but feels as though there is nothing more he can do. Isildur, having settled his affairs in Gondor, would begin to travel north, the ring already beginning to corrupt his mind, and he would then be ambushed on the Gladden Fields. He would attempt to flee the orcs and be shot with arrows as the ring betrays him. This Isildur, with whom we have already spent so much time, and whose personality we have seen grow, flourish, and be tested, will perhaps see the folly of his ways, for who can say? Did Isildur, as he felt the arrows pierce his back, remember the words of Elrond and repent? In either case, the ring will descend into the river, and time itself will seem to run on endlessly as it rests there, all until an unfortunate little store boy happens to find a shiny object while out on a fishing trip. Thus, the show would end, hopefully not outstaying its welcome. I should note once again that I have absolutely no intention of writing any of this for reasons that I will explain very shortly. For now, I should like to return to the alternate season which I actually have written and discuss some of the defects that I find with it. The first thing I wanted to get out of the way is that I suck at maintaining voices, made all the more difficult by the fact that I spent far too much time between recording videos. I'm not a professional voice actor, but I probably still could have done better with this. When it comes to the characters, I've probably made quite a few mistakes, but for a lot of them, I just don't feel like I utilized them that well. For instance, I made absolutely awful use of Elrond, and he really should have been a bigger part of the story. There's not much that Tolkien does with Elrond in his writings about the Second Age, but that is largely because of the fact that he never composed a narrative about 
about it. At least not one like Lord of the Rings or the Silmarillion. And I really should have remedied that defect. Galadriel herself was criminally underutilized, and I'm ashamed that I barely made her a player in her own kingdom beyond generically seeing through Alendil. Despite how horribly utilized she was in the actual show, at the very least she was not underutilized, I suppose. Celebrimbor and Narvi's friendship works fine, I think, but a lot of the other relationships, such as Celeborn and Galadriel, Marigold and her fellow Harfoots, and even Elendil and Celebrimbor could have used a lot more development. Marigold, having stolen the amulet, should have been established in episode 4, but I decided not to do that because it would have involved adding yet another scene to the story. Marigold's plot in general was a big problem for me, both in terms of figuring it out, planning it, and being able to tie it all together. I tried at the very end to develop something along the lines of a character arc before basically dropping it in the final battle, which feels extremely unsatisfying to me, but I'm gonna be honest, I actually just needed the whole thing to be done. In fact, as I was finishing that video, I realized there was a better character arc for her, which was already sort of there with the Easterling commander rebuking her somewhat childish rebellions and attempts to cover up the whispering of her companions. Specifically, I was thinking how Amerigold is now in a world far beyond where the normal rules by which she lived apply, and her failure to recognize that could get herself and others killed. Granted, I don't think the arc would have been fully satisfying even if I did decide to integrate it. The reason I didn't is that episode 8 in particular had taken me way too long, and like I said, I, I just needed it to be over as quickly as possible. That's bad storytelling, and I fully admit that it's an actual problem with the story, but there you go. You are all free to create a headcanon to make it better. What bothers me most, though, is that the story is still not accurate to Tolkien's world, which is especially neglected in the thematic undertones of the story. I think that this is largely because the story the Rings of Power has set up is unworkable from a Tolkienian point of view. The halflings simply don't perform the rule of the bridge between audience and world that they're supposed to play in Tolkien's world, since they aren't the main characters and they aren't what the story is about. There's a reason for why Tolkien specifically didn't include them in the First or Second Ages, even after the publication and immense popularity of Lord of the Rings. This issue actually branches out into a whole host of other small issues, which make this rewrite largely discontinuous with Tolkien's world, and even end up introducing plot holes, some of which, to the show's credit, the Rings of Power does not introduce. For instance, it's hard to believe that Sauron would have completely ignored all hobbits if the orcs were regularly fighting them during his rise to power in the Second Age. In addition to the fact that that one of the nine, Hamu is one of the nine ring wraiths in Tolkien's writings, with one of the nine having taken particular study and interest in at least one of the hobbits, that becomes even more unlikely. A similar problem appears in how I use the dwarvish ring given to Durin. All of the seven dwarvish rings, like the nine human rings, were given by Sauron after he storms Eregion. This, by itself, is forgivable in my opinion. What isn't forgivable is how I force the ring to make Durin behave in order for the story to work. Yes, the dwarves became more greedy with the ring, but I think even Sauron would realize that an offer of rings like the one he makes in The Lord of the Rings to the dwarves wouldn't be enticing if this is how the dwarves acted when they had the rings. Rather than being viewed as a gift, I don't see how the dwarves would see it as anything other than someone asking them to re-enter the den of a man-eating tiger after they had narrowly escaped with one of their limbs torn off and a gash forever crossing their abdomen. There are a bunch of others. I take these examples not because they're specially important or noteworthy, or for any reason in particular. They're simply random examples that came to mind while editing the last video. There are many problems with the story as I have written it. Several of them have to do with the style of diction I ended up using, my recurrent use of the same five reactions for several of the characters, and probably numerous examples of poor writing from the point of view of a stylistic and overall character dynamic, many of which I probably didn't even recognize, and I probably still don't recognize, and I'm sure most of them are far more problematic than the ones I have mentioned. If you so desire, you are more than free to discuss them with me in the comments. In fact, I would actually like for you to do so, as I'm hoping to become less and less defensive about it in general, and more willing to uh, open myself up to criticism because some of these mistakes that I have made are mistakes that I have with my general writing. It is here that, in addition to these blunders and bits of laziness or lack of ingenuity, I need to ask again for everyone's apology for taking such an absolutely long time to write all of this. I have three excuses, which I'm guessing some of you will accept, because you've been so merciful to me so far. 
First of all, I do unfortunately have a life which repeatedly took away my time and attention from writing this. And while it's not true that I would have gotten all these out in a few weeks if this had been my job, I know I could have produced these much more quickly if I had been able to dedicate more free time. The second and third excuses are partially related, in that I both didn't care much about the story, especially not after the second or third episode that I had written, and I just had a general lack of motivation to work on it. Indeed, I effectively figured out the totality of the story a few days after the final episode of Rings of Power aired, and there were very few divergences between it and the final product, but I made the mistake of wanting to turn my outline into an actual script, and when it came to writing it out, recording, and editing each of them, I just found it difficult to work up the motivation each time. And one of the main reasons for this reluctance is that I just didn't feel like this was my best work. I'm by no means a fanfiction writer, and this is the first fanfiction type story I've ever written. I can say now with certainty that I don't like reading it or writing it. As such, I often dedicated my time and energy towards a project which I do consider to be my best work. For, you see, I'm currently writing a novel series into which I feel I can pour all my heart and creativity for the very simple reasons that it is both mine and that it is expansive enough to accept whatever I'm willing to give it. Therefore, as an apology, I have also recorded the prologue for the first novel in the series, which I hope to finish writing relatively soon, within a year or so. I've already finished the first half of the book, and I already have the entire series planned out. I have the video scheduled to post tomorrow. I hope you'll enjoy it, and in the meantime, I desperately hope that you liked this video. Have a nice day.